Eric Brewer, welcome back to the show, man. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So people, if they have not heard the interview that we've done three years ago, if they, after this one, if they want to check the first one out, they can get a little bit more about your background, how you got into real estate. Uh, you got a pretty cool story. So you go into detail on the, the previous show. So I want to definitely cover more of the, the stuff that you've been doing, you know, over the last really five years, five, 10 years with novations, leadership and scaling. And I, you are an expert in all three of those things. So, uh, Let's start out with Novations, just because it's it's kind of the new cool kid on the block now, especially in a changing market. You got a lot of people who don't want to close on properties, and uh, you know you 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 know really popularized this Novation strategy, and a lot of people are having a lot of success. So uh, let's just kind of get into what is a Novation, and then we'll start chopping it up. All right, cool. So um, the gen- I'll give you two different explanations. Um, the legal description of a novation, the word actually just comes from uh, the Latin term novus, which means new. So uh, if you think about general wholesale real estate practice by way of assignment, we have a purchase agreement that creates equitable ownership in the deal. And then we sell effectively, not the property, but our contract or our rights to the the, the property um, through an assignment. Yep. Um, It's obviously created a tremendous amount of wealth and freedom for people. And it's a great way to be able to buy properties that are in generally um, not the best condition and then sell those to people that have the resources and the experience to fix them up and rent them or fix them up, resell them or flip them, as most people know uh, that terminology. Uh, And Novation actually cancels your original purchase agreement. You're like, oh my God, well, why would I want to cancel my agreement? I, I had a deal. Now I don't have a deal. What I was able to do, and this started back in, I was in the, the business in 2008 when the market collapsed. Uh, prior to the recession, virtually none of my customers that were buying my properties were using FHA financing. They were using non-conforming loans, bad credit loans, stated income loans, Um, all of the crazy stuff that was available back then. Um, So I was never exposed to the FHA uh, restrictions that come along with the loan. And for those of you that might not be aware of that, uh, there's deeds restrictions where if you buy a property, fix it up and sell it, an FHA borrower cannot even write a contract to purchase that property from you until the 91st day. Then there's a whole series of like FHA overlays, USDA, VA overlays that have very specific condition requirements. So you can't really sell a fixer upper for the most part to that customer. So you have longer holding periods and typically you have to have, you know, some additional uh, renovation requirements with an FHA borrower that wouldn't be the case with a normal conventional borrower. So when the market crashed in 2008, now 100% of my customers that wanted to buy my house were FHA. It's the only way you could get a loan unless you were a 900 credit score with half down. Yeah. So I was like, what am I going to do? Like I have all these houses that are renovated and I'm fixing up another 80 of them right now. And I went into like a mild form of panic. Yeah. Um, at that volume. Fortunately, in a, in a, shortly after that, um, one of the few things the government has ever done that's positively impacted me is they funded an FHA flip waiver. So Congress actually passed a spending bill that allocated all of these additional funds to ensure additional FHA HUD back mortgages and specifically flip properties because they wanted to incentivize folks like us to buy up all this bank owned foreclosure short sale inventory, renovate it and sell it to willing home buyers that were 620 credit scores that I mean, that's their, their, their voter base, right? So like we're going to create this opportunity for the average normal income American to be able to buy a house. And most of these homes are coming through foreclosure and sheriff sale and short sale and REO and they can't buy them in that condition, but they can buy them in renovated condition. We need to eliminate this FHA weight, this, this flip rule. So they did, they passed an FHA flip waiver um, early in 2009. So things were good, right? I was now buying all of these properties without doing any off market marketing. I was buying HUDs at 30 cents on the dollar, oh. Fannie foreclosures at 30 cents on the dollar, showing up at the sheriff's 
steps and buying properties for 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar. Um, life was good. It was really easy to buy back then because there was very few cash buyers and investors. And there was a sufficient amount of, in my market, FHA first time home buyers. And that was my niche. I sold below the median house price. My core buyer was a first time home buyer using FHA finance. In 2011, Congress did not approve the spending for that bill and that FHA flip waiver went away. So sat down with my attorney and was like, hey, I got to figure out a way to minimize the damage this is going to do to my business. I now, prior to then, was able to buy, renovate, sell, and get paid inside of 90 days. That's amazing. Now I can't even start that process until the 91st day. And it's going to take 45 to 60 days to close those loans. So you figure back then I was flipping 200 homes a year. I would have 40 to 50 property always in renovation. I would effectively have to nearly double my inventory. So there was plenty of those homes to buy, but that requires, you know, another 70, 80 homes at a hundred grand a piece. It's a considerable amount of money. Yeah. Um, so I got to go borrow the debt for that. And then either raise or put up the equity to cover the 20% plus the carrying costs for that property. So wasn't really to that. Sat down, spent a bunch of time and energy with my attorney, found out that obviously the deed seasoning is triggered when you record the deed. So he's like, well, just don't record the deed. I'm like, yeah, but my bank requires that I record the deed in order for me to put it on the line of credit. And that's how we stumbled across Novation Law and then applied it to our off-market transactions uh, because right around 2011, 2012, people started to drift back into the wholesaling fix and flip market because rates had stabilized. The market was now more normal and people slowly started to gravitate back towards uh, either real estate investing as a side hustle or a full-time job. So I wasn't able to just show up at share of sales and buy 50 properties. I couldn't just make an offer on HUD and buy it at 30 cents on the dollar. I had to start marketing again. I had to get good with off-market um, acquisitions. And um, that's how I discovered innovations. Interesting. So basically you had that FHA thing going for you, then it went against you. And now once you, you really dove into these innovations, from my understanding, and I know a little bit about it, you're, you're pretty much getting a property in a regular purchase and sale agreement with a home seller, just like you would with a fix and flip or a rental or whatever, or an yeah. assignment. And then you're exterminating the one contract once you find the retail buyer and then the retail buyer signs a new contract with the seller after because your contract's now null and void and then you're getting paid like an interest release fee at settlement is that how it kind of works for the most part yeah so you can't have two enforceable contracts in play at one time so the original yeah. purchase agreement that we've designed i've closed probably almost 1500 of these transactions now over the last 10, 11 years. Um, when you market and find the third party buyer, you, you extinguish the original agreement in lieu of the third party agreement. And then we created a nova novation release and addendum that says, hey, we're conditionally releasing this contract, right? In yep. lieu of this third party contract, which by the way, was in the language of our original agreement. And it's contingent upon these terms. So you basically take your contracts as is, no commissions, right? No contingencies. Yeah. We lay the new contract on top and any difference between the two is my liability. So anything that would stem from disclosure or commissions, um, any inspections, any appraisals, because that's different is my liability. And oh, by the way, any difference in price is also my compensation for that increased liability. Okay. Um, that makes sense. So the, 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 the mechanism of the release is what makes it a financeable transaction. You cannot assign that same property to a borrower that's using non-commercial lending because it is not an insurable financeable transaction. When you release it, it becomes a financeable transaction and that person can borrow money through any loan product to pay for it. So the key is mm -hmm. when you assign a property, you assign it to an investor. Well, what prices do investors pay? Not investor a lot. Prices. Investor prices. Right? What up. prices do finance retail buyers pay? 100% of market value. 
sometimes a little bit more yeah, depending, depending on, on yeah. Yeah. depending on the year and the market that you're in <laughs> and the interest rate. Right? Um, so that's one thing, right? So what we found is we have over 200 people that I've taught this to and help them implement it into their business. What we've seen um, is, you know, we track net leads here, right? We generate a bunch of leads and then we qualify them down to the people that actually have some type of remote interest in selling and talking to us and yeah. not calling my mother foul names, right? So uh, they don't say, take me off your list, go pound sand, F you, Baldy, and your mama's a, a, a piece of crap, right? So those people get put into a, a different bucket and then everybody else is considered a net lead. Um, and I talk with and you know di different masterminds and stuff, um, a lot of different investors, the, the good investors that do a good job of following up and they got trained salespeople and they, you know, they, they, they communicate with customers prior to the appointment, after the appointment, and they got a good dispo strategy. So they're able to actually sell a deal when they get it. They close about eight to 10% of net leads. So if they get a hundred leads, net leads, and they do their job, they should buy eight to 10 deals. Right. So those are the deals we're already doing. People out there know how to do that. Anybody that's watching us either is already doing it or is on their path to be unable to do it. Right. So what I did is I looked at like this other 90 people. Right. So we did a good job. Like a lot of people. business, which is great. Yeah. 90% of our customers, we don't. Pretty much everyone. <laughs> Correct. So then I started looking at why did those 90% or in this example of 100 leads, why did those 90 people? decide not to do business with us. What I've found, and this is case studies that extend over, you know, 200 operators and, and, and leads and contracts and hundreds of thousands of samples. It is down almost to the percentage, 50% of that 90% aren't likely to convert. They're, they're, they're just not going to sell um, at a price that is even remotely appealing to us. And it's more than 12 months down the road. So either time or money or circumstance does not make them a qualified opportunity. Still in that lead, but not a qualified opportunity, right? The other 50%, let's call it 45 people out of the 90, have a, a slightly interesting different profile than the people that aren't gonna do business with us and a very different profile from the people that have chosen to do business with us. And I use an analogy called the seller seesaw. Right. If you think about the eight to 10 percent of the people that we do business with, you imagine an old fashioned seat. So there's a balancing point in the center and then there's two seats. And depending on the weight that's displaced in that seesaw, it'll go like this or it'll go like this. So the normal seller seesaw of the eight to 10 percent of people that choose to do business with us condition either of the property or their life circumstances is weighing that seesaw down. The natural result is it drives up urgency, motivation, and willingness to discount. It actually crosses over from motivation, which is what a net lead is, and it really requires distress. Mm -hmm. we don't often talk about that because it's kind of a dirty word when you talk to a seller. It makes them feel icky. We say we want a motivated seller. We don't convert motivated sellers. We convert distressed sellers. Yep. Right? If we do a really good job selling, we'll, we'll uncover that distress. Totally. Right. Motivation doesn't normally get them to do business with us. Distress does. It's well, the pain. Can't create the stress. Yeah, yeah. It's pain. Pain is distress. Yes. Right. It's not yeah. motivation. Like if I'm in pain, I'm not motivated. I'm distressed. <laughs> so true. Right? So what happens is, is that other 40% of the people have a more balanced seller seesaw. The condition is not so bad. There's motivation, not the stress. Mm -hmm. so the problem is, is that half of those 90 people have motivation and they have nice properties and our business models in the absence of novations does not give us the ability to convert 50 of our 100 customers. Yep. If you really step back and think about it, it's a flawed business model. It's a needle in a haystack business, dude. And, and then guess what list do people pull? Distressed. Distress. Uh, code bios, foreclosure judgment, bankruptcy, you know, haven't paid your income tax in 17 years, like that yeah, kind of crap. That's the stress. And then everybody's fighting over that same oh, insane. little batch of people. Yeah. How many people are out there going, I want people that have nice homes 
that would consider a reasonable discount but won't give it away. Those people are called realtors. Mm -hmm. And so in your market, if you look at the transactions that close in any given calendar month, 95% of those transactions, if not more, are done through conventional real estate means by real estate agents with people that have nice properties in good condition with motivation, but no distress. Yes. So we're out here as investors clawing over each other, fighting over four to 5% of the market and completely disregarding 95% of the transactions that are taking place. Literally. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So with innovation, you got to balance the seller seesaw. It's like, hey, Greg, I really like what you got to say. I don't care if you close tomorrow, bro. I'm not selling it for a dollar less than a hundred. As is, is fine, but my house is pretty nice. What am I worried about? Right? So now what happens is with innovation, typically in a market where you have a median sale price of 220 plus, you can pay up to 88% of the, and this is the value that nobody talks about. Everybody talks about ARV, MAO, rehab number. Yeah. No one in wholesale ever talks about as is retail financeable value. Oh, I love that, bro. Right? So, so now what you do is you say, hey, Greg, I'm at 75, you're at 100. Normally we plug those people into a follow-up system and they hope that they change their mind. The reality is they're not going to change their mind. Something in that seller seesaw needs to become out of balance in order for them to be distressed yep. enough to sell you the property. It's a very small portion of the population, right? That's what funny. happens though is with novations, when you're at 75 and they're at 100, we never pay attention to the fact that it's as is retail value is 130,000. Now, the really smart people have figured out they can monetize that lead and they call their favorite realtor and say, hey, man, got a great lead for you. Greg's pretty motivated. He's a super nice guy. His last experience with a real estate agent wasn't that great. He was hoping I could buy it for cash. It didn't work out. Him and I are great friends now, but we didn't, we, 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 we made a friend. We didn't make a deal, right? Oh. And then we refer it to our realtor. He sells it for $130,000 in a week and sends us a measly $900 referral check. 25%. Everybody's like, dude, that's awesome. I, I, I monetized that lead. I'm a stud. I did three of those last month. <laughs> yeah. Versus learning how to novate. The seller says 100. You understand how to do that deal. You sell it for 129. You still pay your favorite realtor a commission. And yeah. get the referral and pocket the $22,000 that's left over. Totally. So you you're take, needed too, bro. actually are able to move out of the ugly house business into the pretty house business. And it doesn't require cash. You don't have to learn how to renovate. You don't need lines of credit. You don't have to raise private money. By the way, remember, these are still in that, that, that funnel of leads you're already talking to. Think about this. When, when a lead manager talks to a customer and the customer says, yeah, I was thinking about selling. I'm relocating. You're like, oh, that's pretty good. How long have you owned the house? 25 years. Oh, this is getting good. What's the condition of the roof? Just replaced it two years ago. Damn it. <laughs> How about the kitchen? What, what, I put a new kitchen about three years ago. Son of a bitch. <laughs> What's the carpet like? Don't have carpet. Put hardwood floors in about five years ago. They're perfect. Lead manager's like, oh, this is a shitty lead. They're not motivated. That, what do you, so you're, the nicer the house, our business model diminishes Motivates. the motivation it's yeah. stupid yeah it's like ah sir only call me if your house really reeks of cat piss it's <laughs> no smells no leaks i can't help you think about that right it's like yeah, it's i know like, this because we we get these lead i mean this is like our business it's like the net lead thing we do the same thing and it's like oh your house is great how come we're on the phone can't help you yeah yeah well, and of course they went close to retail the, the difference is with novations close to retail works. Totally. If they want 200 and it's worth 235. Normally, ah, can't help you. With a novation, 235 minus typically when we establish relationships with real estate agents, we pay out a two and a half percent buyer's agent commission. You're typically able to hire an agent if you do a reasonable amount of business with them at a 1% listing commission, maybe one and a half. So you're paying out 4%. 4% off of 225 is 9,000. 225 minus nine is 16. It's a $16,000 rip on a house and a lead that you would have thrown away. Dude, I and that's, love And that's that. I mean, at that number, you're paying nine. That's 90% of as is retail value. And the sellers, oh man. And this is why I love this because the seller is really getting 
all of the benefits of a as is certain transaction minus and netting very and netting very close to netting. what they would if they listed it. Exactly. And then they don't have to deal with all the BS of dealing with commissions, all of the repairs. So they're pretty much getting what they want or what they would have got. And they're getting all the benefits an investor would have provided them because their house isn't jacked up. So they don't need to have this. I call it the cash hammer in our company. I'm like, Brett, what's the cash hammer number? And then he'll tell me and then we'll say, okay, what can we know? So there's a that? couple of cool things that come out of that, right? Um, one, we've actually created an infographic. It's an entire program. We call our equity protection program. Hmm. So, you know, I geek out on sales a little bit. I love talking to customers. Oh, yeah. I come up with really weird stuff to say that if it works, I stick with it. Yeah. And what we teach and what we train our folks to do um, that, that work with us here, we buy you know a couple hundred homes a year. Um, and then the 200 plus people that work with us inside of the course that we sell to teach Novations is we call it the equity protection program. Why? Well, a couple of years ago, me and my partner sat down and we said, you know what? I'm tired. Nine out of 10 times I get turned down. I'm meeting these really nice people that have nice homes and nice neighborhoods. And we're getting two hours into a conversation and we want to do business together, but something silly like money keeps us from making a deal. Now, I understand why you, sir, you, you, you've been very flexible with me, but I get why you're not willing to sell it for less than $200,000. You got a lot of memories here. You put a lot of work into it. And hopefully you can understand as an investor why I can't pay market value with the integrity of the investment is lost. Um, I could make a couple deals, but over the course of the next month or two, I'd be out of business. And that's not good for anything. Right. So what I did is I sat down with my partner and I said, how can we pay people more money without jeopardizing the integrity of the investment? And first he laughed at me like loud, like went out in the hallway and told everybody I thought we could pay people more money for their homes. And then after he stopped making fun of me, we sat down. I was like, hey, man, I'm really serious. Like, how can we do this? <laughs> and I'm not quite sure this program would even work for you or your situation. Uh, I don't even know for certain that if you wanted to be part of it, that I could get you qualified. But I've already let the cat out of the bag. Let me just explain it to you. Is that something you're even interested in hearing? And well, we came up with this equity protection program. Effectively, what it does is it allows us to give you more money for your, your house maybe even all the way up to the 200 that you're asking. And uh, the only two things that you have to be flexible on versus what we talked about earlier, uh, I had mentioned to you that we can close in as little as 30 days or two weeks. And you said, Greg, I'm in no hurry. That's why I think this might be for you because it does require a little bit of flexibility when it comes to settlement. But if I heard you loud and clear, um, you said, hey, it doesn't matter to me if it takes three months. That's why I think this might be a good fit for you. Um, the second thing is I need reasonable access. So the reason that language is important is when you say listing, it sounds like a listing. When I say reasonable access, it doesn't trigger or remind them of selling it through the MLS. That's the other word we don't use is MLS. We use open market, right? Mm -hmm. Flexible settlement, reasonable access, open market. And then um, so that's a, and then I tied in at our company, we tied into our mission statement and our core values. For us to be able to meet with 100 people and only buy 10 homes, we felt like the messaging that we were putting out there about buying homes for cash and paying the top dollar, it was hard for me to go home at night that say I was acting in integrity because 90% of the time I wasn't giving people what they thought was top dollar. Mm. So just in the line with our core values. So that's what really drove us to come up with this program. And then we do like a nice infographic. Um, have you ever seen like those... Um, animated uh explainer videos oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. made. we've had those made that walk people through how this process works and it makes it really easy for acquisitions and salespeople to explain and then it's a cool piece of leaves behind collateral that when another wholesaler comes and goes there's no way they can pay you that they go yeah they can look right here's the program and they they can't figure it out they don't understand how it works um so that's how we've not only created the program, but made it easy for sellers to understand, made it easy for salespeople to explain. And then the best part is it sets very, very clear expectations on the front end of the transaction. So once it's in the MLS, their neighbor sees it on Zillow, there's a yard in the, or a yard, there's a yard in the front sign, there's a sign <laughs> in the front yard, right? That's all been disclosed up front. We've introduced in a phased approach, a very simple contract that they sign at settlement. 
But then we turn it over to our TC, Transaction Coordinating Department, and they slowly start to introduce the listing documents. In some cases, most people are asking us to use a power of attorney because they don't want to deal with all of this paperwork. We go, hey, here's all of the paperwork we would need you to sign. We do have an attorney, in fact, or a limited power of attorney that a lot of people like to use because it cuts back on all this paperwork. If you have any interest in that, let us know. And they go, well, how's that work? More than 50% of our people end up signing a limited power of attorney, and then they never have to be part of any of that listing paperwork. They don't have to be part of any of the initialing, signing of the third-party contract. Heck, they don't even have to show up to settlement. They can just get it's a, a white glove service, bro. It's, it's a white glove service. So, and we don't necessarily, I mean, obviously it creates convenience for us, but it helps maintain that convenience that they were looking for in the beginning. And then we 100% control the access showings, all of that, the reasonable access. We maintain all of that, not our real estate agent, because we don't want to lose the communication with the seller and hand them off to someone else. All of that communication is retained internally, even once the property is, is sold and listed with an outside agent, all of that communication still passes through us. Dude, the thing I love about this too, and from I've realized from as we make these offers now is with an assignment of contract. And listen, we still both do assignments. A lot of people do assignments yeah. from CG. They're just the biggest mastermind in the country. An assignment is less transparent than an ovation. I don't care what anyone says. I got my contractor going there. I, we had a deal like last night. I had 17 yeah. contractors in the house. You know what I mean? And it's and like- one of them just happened to be at settlement writing a check. It's like, <laughs> oh, your contractor's a money guy too? Oh yeah, he's a jack of all trades. He does drywall and lending. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, I mean, so now some people have figured it out, right? Like we're just, we're, we're overly transparent even with yeah. our assignments. Yeah. So, hey, we may buy this, we may not. Um, we can take on about 12 to 15 new renovation projects a month. We take the 12 or 15 sometimes easiest projects or the projects that have the biggest upside. And then a lot of times we'll sell the other properties to some of the other investors locally um, that are really good at construction, but wouldn't have a clue about how to sit down and work through everything you and I went through today. Yeah. Um, but that's okay, right? As long as you get your 70,000, you have any concerns about that? They're like, no. It's like, okay, exactly. sign here, press hard. So it, 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 there's, but that I can tell you for the folks that are a little dodgy about that explanation, which I get, like when you're making a deal, it's like, well, I don't want to get into all of that right now. I want to get it signed. But the novation forces you to be transparent. Yeah. You can't can, get around you it. Absolutely not. You can't dance around that topic because it's going to be on Zillow. It's going to be in the MLS. They're going to see it. For more money. So you might as well talk about it up front. Or you don't really have a deal because they're going to freak out. Um, once they see that and go, hey, man, this isn't what we talked about. Like, what's going on? Um, so, yeah, we're, we're really big um, on a phased introduction of documents um, post-contract um, pre-listing where we're just overly disclosed. Um, and it's been really successful for us. It's about 40 percent of our business. We do, you know, 12 to 15 of those a month, um, about 150 of them a year. That's amazing. And the big benefit too, for people who are doing a lot of paid media, like you, me, and a lot of people listening is you're already getting these leads. These leads are already in your inbox. They're already in your CRM. So you don't have to go out and get the novation list. The novation list is pretty much, you know, 90% of who you're already marketing to. You know what I mean? Yeah. I tell you one great thing is, is like, we do a lot of TV. TV's not so targeted, right? No, it's broad. Um, one of the cool things that I learned, uh, which is kind of off topic, but um, I buy a hundred homes a year from TV that are on none of my list. Mm. So the reality is there's people out there that'll sell, sell quickly and sell at a reasonable discount that don't have visible signs of distress. Yeah. Right? So you would have never known. You wouldn't. Um, or it's very early on in the motivation distress process. And it's not a recordable, visible event through whatever, right? Like they haven't filed for a divorce, but they're not getting along. Um, yeah. Maybe yeah. they didn't lose their job, but he was late yesterday. I don't, it's, you know, you're, you're further up the food chain. Um, but to, to your point is a lot of those leads that come in are really nice houses. Like the, we did the largest novation in the history of our company. Um, it was within the last 12 months. I don't know if it was 2021 or 2022, but it was, um, it was 2130. I'll remember this for a long time. 2138 Smith Station Road in Hanover, Pennsylvania. It was a 4,000 square foot, somewhat recently remodeled 
farmhouse with an addition, two barns, an outbuilding on 25 acres with its own pond. Damn. That's just not a, and I got it from a TV lead. I generally wouldn't have bought that house. Now it turns out we got a pretty good deal, but the deal that we negotiated was a $600,000 contract. I felt really strong. It was worth $699 in condition. But if I close on that, I'm chewing up $30,000, $35,000 in funding, closing costs, transfer tax, um, prorated real estate taxes. So then if it sells for six seventy five dollars because I was off by 5%, now I made $15,000 and I tied up over a half a million bucks. I just wouldn't have done the deal. Yeah, I did the deal because I have what we call novation muscles, which means when you know you can take nice properties and bring them to the MLS and you got 60 to 90 business days to shop it on the market, you can do some deals that you otherwise wouldn't do. The best buyers list in the world is the MLS. We do all of this work to try, but, but, but we can't get access to the MLS because of the normal wholesale strategy. I'm buying your house. I'm not going to sell it. I'm going to fix it up. It's not so transparent. So most wholesalers can't list on the MLS. So they have these great core, right? Buyers. Yeah. But those buyers don't pay enough. Because they got to make a profit. And there's only a hundred of them, two or 300 of them, the you know? Yourself, and I can tell you there's cash buyers on the MLS that won't show up on any of your buyers list because it's their first deal, right? <laughs> or they're a cash buyer, but they're not an investor. Totally. So that house we locked up for 600, 90 day settlement, um, full blown reasonable access. Uh, we sold it for seven ninety five. Oh, in ten days. Uh, that is amazing. Um, I had two offers. One was conventional appraisal, all that stuff. The buyer that won the deal was all cash, no inspections. So after commissions, we netted one hundred and sixty grand. Um, that's amazing. Gross was almost 200,000. I just, I wouldn't have done. So people go, well, I mean, if you made 200, you could have closed on it and still made money and maybe flipped it. I was like, I could have, but I didn't know that until it was sold. Totally bro. Totally. When I was analyzing the, the deal on the front. It made, it made my palms a little sweaty, right? It's like we do deals yeah. for 150, 250 grand. That's in Pennsylvania. That's our normal market, right? $600,000. I just didn't feel real warm and fuzzy about doing that deal. I definitely didn't want to renovate it. I mean, it was clean, but it had like baby blue carpet in the bathroom, like hand painted pink stencils on the wall tile. Um, it smelled like grandma's home cooking, right? It was like a, and it was an older, you know, older couple that owned it. They owned it for a long time. Um, they actually had, you know, we talk about distress. These folks were very wealthy. Um, they had multiple properties. Their kids had moved to Florida. Um, they had no reason really to be in Pennsylvania anymore and just kind of wanted to be done. Um, and they were okay selling it for what they thought was a fair price and knew that they were, I mean, she signed the settlement sheet that showed my fee of $165,000 on it. Um, she got what she wanted, bro. She got she what she wanted and you provided all the value and the benefits that you stated and you, you got some extra upside there. But I want to make a quick point because I do a lot of wholetailing and, and that's a strategy that has worked very well recently, which is when you just close and relist. Yeah. But there's a lot of risk. And even in my area, like just the closing costs are insane in New York. It's insanity. Like just to close on a property, yeah. it's like we have about 30 to 40 grand in soft costs because we're doing expensive houses. And that's money that I can't get back. Right. Once you get on. Oh, the and then the other thing is I wouldn't generally worry about it. For, I don't know, probably the last 10 years. Yeah, but there's a possibility now you put a property under contract, you close on it in 60 days, you do a little bit of work, you list it 60 days later, the market could pivot a little bit. 100%. So now on top of the cost, there's this new element of risk that hasn't really been around for a long time, right? But if it's a $300,000 house and it drops by 10%, like that could be all of your profit. Literally. Um, so that's a little, I mean, we'll still do those deals. We pay really close attention to the timelines on wholesales when we do buy a property and take it down. Um, but here's the reality. So normally we found that the people that are decent operators convert 10% of those 40. So if you if you get 100 net leads, whatever time frame that takes you, if that could be six months, if you do 100 net leads, you get good at doing novations. Not even great. You just get good. 
you should convert 10% of those 40 people. That's four deals out of every, that's basically half of what you're doing now. So you can increase your, your, your volume by 50% by learning and implementing novations in your, 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 your process, right? Because 10% of those 40 people, if you make a compelling offer, uncover motivation, you should close 10% of those. That's like bare minimum. If you have a pulse and, 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 a, and a semblance of a process, you should close 10% of those 40. The best people are doing 15 to 20%. So out of every 100 leads, they're adding another six to eight transactions. And the average profit across the 200 or so folks that we have that we've helped teach this to is over $26,000. It's more than uh, most people's assignment fees. It is, um, which makes good sense, right? Because you're selling to a non-financially motivated seller. You have an, you're selling to, you're buying from an emotional seller, selling to an emotional buyer. That is the ideal circumstances, right? Yeah. Uh, where normally we buy from a, a, an emotional seller and sell to a very- Logical buyer. Logical buyer. And it's Numbers like, hey, I don't, Yeah, I don't, I'm fine. I'll just wait for another deal as an investor. It's just math. Totally. Um, so yeah, you should be able to, and then the other thing is um, about 25% of your existing wholesale deals, we're seeing those get converted to Novation deals. So instead of making $15,000 of wholesaling it, it's in a good enough condition. We're introducing equity protection program of middle, certainly before the end of negotiations saying, hey, you know, Greg, you're at 75. Maybe I could go to 75 and wholesale it. But I started with an anchor of 50. When I get to 60, I'm going to propose that they consider the equity protection program because I believe that would allow me to get them the amount of money that they want. And they're going to go, yeah, that sounds good. So now you locked it up at what your MAO was anyway. But now instead of having to wholesale it, you've got authorization from them for reasonable access, the ability to put it on the open market and flexibility on settlement dates. So instead of selling it to an investor for 90, you list it in the MLS and it sells for 120. And instead of making 15, you make 35. So you get 25% of your existing deals. You're adding another 15 to $20,000 profit. And then you should be adding for every hundred net leads for additional transactions. So you can do the math based on the amount of leads that anybody watching this is getting. Um, for us, a hundred net leads is a week. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, some people that might be two months worth of leads. So you can squeak out another two transactions per month going to put some big money in your pocket. piece that's half a million bucks i mean that that's it's, it's just going to change their business from being able to take the leads they already have learn a new strategy and ultimately add more value like i like your sign behind you you get paid for your value not your time which is i think it's yeah. a zoom background but uh yeah. you know you could just put more money in your pocket help more people so that's Eric, the key like that, that was the thing for us that got a ton of buy-in from our people is i can help more people Right. So right. there's like the financial paycheck that comes along with that is like, hey, I can do another one or two deals per acquisitions agent per month. We have six acquisitions agents. That's another 12 deals that has an immediate financial impact on each and every one of those people that increases their income by, you know, two deals, 40 grand. They make an extra fifty thousand dollars. A year because we we have this unique advantage over everybody else. Um, the second part was, is they're actually, they're, they're now able to help four out of every 10 people, not one. Exactly. And if you think about that from a salesperson's perspective. The one thing you got to be most protective over as a sales manager or an owner operator that has people that work for you is you got to be very protective over their attitude. Their attitude directly impacts their effort. Their effort directly impacts their results. And their results comes back around and directly impacts their attitude. So if you can help them double the deals that they do and help more people, they're likely to show up each and every day with a better attitude. It's a positive feedback loop, man. You can help more customers. Brewermethod.com is the site to check out if they want to like dive deep in innovations, right? Yeah, man. So like, and so one thing it's that people are like, ah, like, dude, that sounds like hard. Like, you're going to give me a bunch of documents and I'm supposed to figure it out. So the one thing we've done is uh, I've in that, it's not just like a, it's, we teach it 
So if someone decides to sign up, I have 15 to 20 unique documents and scripts from everywhere from lead managers to acquisitions agents to even how to onboard this transaction with a listing agent, a lender, uh, a buyer's agent, and a title company. Um, plus, we've developed um, a couple worksheets that we call net proceeds addendum that documents, hey, there's two different amount of monies that are being um, distributed here. Here's the seller's calculation of how they're getting what they're get. Here's the calculation of what I'm getting. Uh, that's a document that we get notarized for every transaction. It makes it very easy for the seller to understand how much money they're getting and why and how much money I'm getting and why. Um, I've recorded 12 full videos where I walk through each and every step to, to, to start a novation conversation at lead management level, how to overcome common objections at the acquisitions level, how to close on common objections, then how to get the deal into your pipeline. Like how does TC manage the, the, the file? How do you introduce these transactions to your title company? How to overcome common objections from them? Because when you introduce this to a title company, they're going to go, huh? What's, what are you doing? Right? <laughs> they don't understand it. So generally what they don't understand, they're going to reject. So the oh, one thing yeah. we realized is you can't send them 30 documents where you oh. bought it, sold it, and got a POA. They're going to go, what are you doing? So we teach a phased approach about how to introduce the documents to the people as needed. And then we give you some scripting behind how to introduce it. And then we've included six free coaching calls with me or my staff. We found that most people, once they do two deals, they're on their own. They know how to do it. It's just like doing their deals now. But in order to get through those two deals, they normally need about two or three support calls because they've got stuck somewhere because it's new. So yeah. we have a, a portal. You get a username and password. It gives you access um, to our website that has all of those 12 videos that I've recorded um, where I do case studies and I walk through the documents. So anybody that you train that's new on your team can log right in, watch all 12 of those videos. We do a 90 minute onboarding call with you and all of your staff to teach them the details of what I sort of glazed over the last 30 minutes. Um, and then you get six free coaching calls. So if you get stuck somewhere along the way, uh, you can log right in, hop on one of our Calendly's um, and help, uh, you know, get, get someone on the phone to help you get unstuck. And then once you do two or three deals, you sort of have the hang of it. And now we're just friends. It's like riding a bike, bro. With the first Pretty much, yeah. A little while for anybody that's doing wholesaling and stuff now. Um, I tell you who really catches on to this quickly is people that are doing creative finance, like mm -hmm. getting someone to give you their property subject to oh, is so way hard. harder oh. than just getting someone to give you 60 yeah. days in a lockbox. Like that's really yeah. what you need. So if you give me 60 days in a lockbox, I'll give you two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, Sub subject so, to yeah, man, yeah. When you do those deals, it's just hard, right? It's like they're they're literally trusting in you for the next 22 years to make their mortgage payment. Yeah, it's um, not easy. So it's valuable. I think, quite frankly, I think sub two is going to be huge uh, coming up with the market change. You're going to have a lot of people with no equity, but a really discounted interest rate. Totally. So that should be interesting to see. But yeah, um, and that's the big thing. And the other people, I think for a long time, Novations um, have been taught um, as a way to fix and flip homes, th this is, this is revenue without renovation. Like our average expense on a novation deal is probably 1500 bucks. And it's generally like punch list style stuff. Like when you sell to FHA buyers, which we sell to a lot here, it's like GFCIs within 12 inches of a water source, missing handrails at the attic or basement steps, peeling paint on a garage window, um, it's very punch list inspection style repairs. You are not renovating the home. So it's a wholesale style transaction at retail prices. So you're able to buy it close to retail and sell at 100% of retail. It's almost like a wholesale deal without closing on it. Pretty much, yeah. You know? Brewermethod.com is the site to check it out. So Eric, before I let you go here, there's there's one thing that I, and I follow you, you know, online. I watch all your stuff. I always listen to every podcast you go on. So I got to just acknowledge, you. man, your stuff is freaking great. I love that you're putting out a lot of content now. I learned a lot from it. A lot of people I know, I send your videos to them and I'm like, you got to watch this stuff. I, I mean, Thanks. it's it's really good. So one thing that you have mastered and you're helping a lot of people do now is how to really scale their business the right way. We only have a couple more minutes left, so I, I want to respect your time. 
But when it comes to scaling the business, like if, if you, let's say we have an investor doing two deals a month and they've been doing that for a while, they're making decent income, but they want to go from two to let's say eight deals a month within a reasonable timeline within, you know, one to one and a half years. What are some things that you see when you work with clients? Cause I know you do some coaching, you know, just on scaling as well. What are some things that you advise them to, to really make sure that they're scaling the right way? Cause I, we have a lot of friends who have scaled the wrong way and they've scaled themselves into chaos. So you don't really turn the boat and, and sink the boat versus scaling smartly. If that makes sense. There's two things. Love it. That's it. People and process. Mm. Uh, it's funny. I actually had an opportunity to, to work with someone yesterday um, who's not directly in the real estate business. He is the like go-to CPA accountant for the nation's top investors. And I went out and spent a day with him in Springfield, Missouri yesterday um, to do some quarterly planning. And somewhere along the lines, I said to him, the behavior that created this opportunity is the opposite of the behavior that will maximize this opportunity. Interesting. And what we were talking about was he was very protective of 50% of the work that needs to get done. And he felt like he was protecting his people from having to do the additional work. And through some healthy conflict inside of that meeting that I was able to poke at a little him bit, up a little bit. Him out, because he wasn't, he wasn't protecting them from the work. He was cheating them out of the opportunity. Mm. And that was new for him, right? He had always been a doer, not a leader. And that's the thing. So it's not hiring people. You have to learn how to actually lead people. And um, that's not something that a lot of us do when we're doing two deals. We're, we are the people. Yeah. And it might seem like not a big deal when you add one person, but you've increased the complexity of the communication in your organization by 200%. Right? And then what's the one thing, if you think about it, if you were to go to battle, my good friend Gary Harper tells me this all the time. If you were a general in charge of the American troops, and you were going into battle, and you could cut off one thing that your enemy did no longer, that no longer had access to, what would it be? It would devastate it. Cut off the communication of your people. So when you start to add people and communication becomes more complex, when it becomes more complex, it's less likely to happen. So when we scale chaos or irresponsible, it's mainly because we've added people without process, which makes communication more complex, which then reduces communication, which leads to resentment, and then eventually stress and certain death. Not death, but you get it. Like yeah, it's just you go back to doing what you were doing. I was happier doing. when I did when I did three deals a month and I made a little bit of money, and now I do twenty deals a month and I hate myself. Yep. Um, it's a real thing. So it's, it's just people in process. And I don't want to minimize that's it's, it's simple, but it's definitely not easy. Yeah. And for me, it took a commitment for me to, to no longer be focused or obsessed with being the best investor. And I had to be become obsessed with being the best business owner and the best leader. So like the guy asked me yesterday, he said, what do you do all day? <laughs> and I was like, I just like love on people, dude. Like, I have conversations that aren't about transactions. I have conversations that are about what happens when they leave the office. I now have a deeper understanding of why people come to the office, not what they do when they're here. Mm. So we've recently been able to, we did a project where we went through and defined my personal purpose in life. It was a pretty, I did this with a group of our leadership team. We have seven leaders on our team high level executives. And then we said, well, how does that align with the business? It was like, it perfectly aligns. Like we help people. Like my whole goal was to be able to leverage my experience to be able to create a belief in our people that they can do anything and faith in other people that they can do anything. That's our company's purpose. Right. And then you start to tie in and goes, well, Hey, Mike, who's in charge of my construction, what really makes you tick? What do you love? Turns out there was a lot of similarities. So then we're like, this is really good. I've created a deeper level of connection with our people. We now communicate that in all of our, you know, weekly communication. And then they took it down to everybody that works inside of each one of those departments. And we know what makes each and every person here tick. And I can tell you less than 25% of it has to do with money. 
And um, generally it's what we do. Like if someone's underperforming, we think it's money, it's not. And if they want more responsibility, we think that's just because of money and it's not. Um, so that's the long, long version. The short version is you got to get really good at people in process. And if you haven't read the book, Who Not How, you need to Great go book. read that because I suck at process, but I have a bunch of people that are really good at it. That's a great book. Um, so yeah, man, that's the best. Uh, Dude, that's a great, that's a great answer. That is, it's easy to like, people can just take that and they can go work on how to actually implement that. But it's, it's, I like how you made it so simple because it, it, it might be simple, but it's not easy. It's like anything really like the whole thing. It's really business, hard actually. Yeah. But it's, it's super tough. rewarding. So yeah. Here's a quick thing I want to share with you just before we wrap the show up. So I have I have a small team now. I was a one man show for a while and I decided to level up. So I'm actually taking this leadership course now called The Hero's Journey with Aaron Hardy. It's a really good, you know, leadership course. And he was talking about like praise, like one of the modules was all about praise and like giving your team gifts when they perform well. So like my acquisitions guy is really good on the phone and I've trained him and he's been through John's training and all that stuff. And I got him a plaque the other day and I sent it right to his house. And it's like, Brett, the house buying king, the master of rapport, the best at commitment. It's like, I appreciate all you do and sent him a plaque in the mail. And he's got this big ass plaque now on his wall. Cause it's all true. And just showing him like, man, I appreciate you. You're, you know, you've changed our business, which he has, he's gotten us, you know, he's scaled us up. Now we're doing like seven, eight houses a month. We were doing like two or three. So just like showing them that I care. And like my assistant, it's like, I really do care about them and I want them to win. And like, it's my goal to become the leader I need to be in order to lead them so I can help them get to where they want to get to. You know what I mean? And it's, it's really awesome. fulfilling. I'm not going to lie. It's very fulfilling. To I'll do tell that. you here first, something that we should have in the next, we'll have a town hall meeting next Wednesday, but you obviously are familiar with the terminology of a price anchor, right? Oh, of course, man. So we, have you ever heard of the turnover chain in college football? No, I have not. So the that turnover is. chain in college football is what they incentivize defenses to force turnovers because they can measure that as a KPI that if you win the turnover yeah. comparison in a game, you're likely to win. So they wanted to incentivize defensive turnovers for their defense. So they have this big like run DMC slick Rick gold chain this big. And then they put like their big, like, um, whatever the teams, uh, you know, if they're the Bears, oh, oh, yeah, Sanders, like a bear of Crusader. And whoever forces a turnover, they come run into the sidelines, and everybody puts the turnover chain. That's awesome. To where the turnover chain is this big celebration. I have an anchor chain being made. That's a big gold <laughs> fake, right? Yeah. Gaudy looking chain with a big gold anchor on it. <laughs> Each month, we're going to give out the anchor chain to the person that that started with and closed the lowest price anchor. So that's the one thing you definitely celebrate. And here's what most people miss is they miss an opportunity to celebrate their team success because they don't measure it. Mm. So they think that measuring and accountability is a negative thing, but it's not. If you measure their performance, not just contracts, but how many appointments did you go on? How many appointments did my lead manager schedule? How many quality conversations they did. You should celebrate all of that stuff, right? And then what it does is it encourages it, right? Like it's, that's the real key, right? So that people love that encouragement and they're more likely to go out of their way to do it again because they like the attention that comes with it. So 100%. you'll see it. I'll have to send you a picture. I'll text you a picture when we hand out the first anchor chain. Oh, I'm looking forward to it, man. I love that. That's a great, that's a great analogy. It's a great little, it's, it's just the symbol. Like it's, it's memorable, right? Like they get the chain now. They're like, oh my gosh, I got to go do another anchor. And then you help more people, the business Maybe grows. Maybe they'll hang it. We have all of our acquisitions agents drive company cars that are all wrapped and stuff. Oh, Maybe yeah. I can get them to hang the anchor chain from the, <laughs> their, their rear view mirror like the old air fresheners. <laughs> That's funny, man. Well, listen, dude, I could talk to you all day. I want to respect your time. If they're interested in the Novation class, brewermethod.com. Eric, if they want to follow you on social, what's the best way for them to, because you put out uh, a lot of good I'm stuff. I'm on Instagram. Um, you can look me up, Eric Brewer. I believe it's underscore invest. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. You can just search for Eric Brewer. Um, I'll also, Greg, I'll send you, if anybody has interest in Novations, but isn't quite ready to sign up, it is a significant investment. It's $5,000. Um, I do offer free 15 minute um, sort of discovery calls 
um, where they can figure out whether or not it's a good fit or if they feel comfortable with the language and scripting that it takes to get those deals closed. I'll text you my Calendly link, and then you're more than welcome to share that either in the body of this or whatever. And uh, they can go on and schedule a 15 minute call and I'm happy to um, walk them through it. And that's completely free. There's no charge. That's awesome. I appreciate that. We'll put that, we'll have Anna put all that in the show notes, man. Well, Eric, it's a pleasure talking to you, buddy. Always good catching up. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk soon, man. Take care, bro.